strategy and transformation, and I have the mental health and addictions portfolio uh, as part of uh, my role in uh, at Unity Health. And a big part of what we do at Unity is care for the disadvantaged and the venerably housed, and it's a deeply rooted part of, of what we do as part of our work, our hospital's history, and our strategy. Hosting the Odette Lecture in 2022 uh, is an important part of that continued work to address homelessness and mental health. And it is a real privilege to be here in person, even if it is partially in person and partially online. Uh, it's a nice change uh, from, from where we've been. So I want to thank Dr. Howard Coe, our keynote speaker, who's joining us from Boston, and all of you for joining us in person and online. And a special thanks to the Odette family pioneers in Canadian philanthropy and for creating this lecture series, which brings together the world's foremost experts on homelessness and mental health. We'll start tonight with a land acknowledgement. As we gather today, we acknowledge this land, the people, and all other beings, animate and inanimate, today as well as the ancestors. This area has been a place of communities coming together for well over 15,000 years. This land has been the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Piton Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois, Confederac Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. We are also mindful of the broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations, sharing stories and telling the truth of this place. Miigwech, Niawen, thank you. So every day we witness firsthand the impact of homelessness on people's health and the lives in our emergency department, in our family health unit, and our mental health clinics, and right outside the doors of our hospital. And that is why this lecture is so important to us. We believe that homelessness can be prevented if we as a society recognize that anything less than decent, affordable housing is unacceptable. Housing is as essential to the health of our population as affordable medications, wholesome food, clean air, and fresh water. Fortunately, our scientists and staff are on the front lines of this effort. They led the Canadian study that tested how the Housing First approach. Housing First understands that giving people who are homeless and struggling with mental illness a home without preconditions is key to breaking a cycle of moving from hospital to shelters to the streets and back again. In fact, its success influenced the province of Ontario to set a goal to end chronic homelessness by 2025. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit Toronto, it brought the homelessness crisis into sharp focus for all of us. We saw just how vulnerable those who are homeless and living with mental illness are to virus transmission and serious health complications. So St. Michael's took action to provide them with safe and effective health care in hospital and in the community. And now we're looking beyond the pandemic and working with partners across the city and with healthcare institutions across the country to find permanent solutions to homelessness and precarious housing in Canada. It's a huge challenge. It's an ambitious goal, but it's one we'll stop at nothing to achieve. As healthcare providers, we know if we're going to move the needle on one of society's most pressing, chronic, and visible health equity issues, we need to build a healthcare workforce that is knowledgeable about it. We've got to educate and train healthcare professionals right from the start of their careers on the social determinants of health and solutions to address these root causes. And that's what we'll be hearing about today from our speakers and panelists. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Howard K. Coe, is the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of Practice of Public Health Leadership, Health Policy and Management at Harvard University. He's also the inaugural chair of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health Initiative on Health and Homelessness. Prior to that, Dr. Koh served as Assistant Secretary for Health under President Barack Obama and as the Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we're really thrilled to have you here today. 
After his keynote, Dr. Ko will be joined on stage by three local homelessness experts, Dr. Karen Shin, Keith Hambly, and Harriet Kikinda, to delve deeper into the topic. Emily Matthew, a journalist who has spent a great deal of time covering homelessness and precarious housing, will moderate. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ko to the podium. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction and what a great honor it is to be here in Toronto and to join you for this very important presentation. Uh, I must say in the weeks leading up to today, I've been so impressed by the commitment of the organizers. I've met so many of you, I think you're all my best friends by now. Uh, we have a fantastic panel and I really want to thank uh, Emily Matthew and Dr. Karen Shim and, and Keith Hambly and Harriet Kakinda. We, Met so often, I think you're all my buddies right now. Uh, I want to thank uh, St. Michael's Foundation and St. Michael's Hospital. A uh, very special thanks to the Odette family and, and to the visionary impact that you've, had, you've made. And special thanks to uh, Mr. Lou Odette, who is here today. Uh, this is such an impressive group, so committed to service to the underserved. And uh, it's an honor to be uh, with you today. Okay, so we're going to talk about homelessness, which is an increasingly visible humanitarian crisis. And I start with those, this opening slide because this issue is getting more and more press attention, especially through the challenges of the COVID era. And here are just some of the headlines that uh, we can see from newspapers in Canada, here in Toronto, and th throughout the rest of Canada. And then in my country of the United States, where homelessness is seems to be in the headlines almost daily. In LA, uh, where there's a lot, a lot of frustration and anger in the community there. In my hometown of Boston, where our new mayor was faced with encampment sites at what's called Mass and Cass, and that represented one of our first challenges in how to address this. In New York City, where the new mayor, Adams, has been put to the test with a migrant crisis. And they have a right to shelter law that we can get into uh, through the discussion today. So this is just some hint of what a complicated and dynamic and visible crisis uh, this is. So how do we start? We need data and information. So one of the major takeaways from this presentation is that the data we have is really only an estimate form and we need so much better data and science and research if we're gonna make any real evidence-based impact on this challenge. So I just put some representative numbers here for Canada and the US. Of course, Canada is about one-tenth the size of the US, so the absolute numbers are smaller. The, the rates appear to be somewhat less too, and I'll show you that uh, in the next slide. But regardless of the number, the, this is still a major challenge in our two countries, and indeed in so many countries around the world. So on the left, you see how the estimates are generated. Probably everybody here knows about so-called point-in-time counts. And that means exactly what it says, that one night a year, volunteers go out in Toronto, in Boston, and other places, and literally count the number of people who appear to be homeless, and that generates the number. You can imagine the wide range of confidence that one would have in a number like that, and they're often gross underestimates. And then of course, since it's only one point in time, we cannot track trends through seasons. And um, trying to compare them year in and year out is very difficult, particularly since attempts to do so through COVID have been very difficult, as I'm sure it was in your country. If you uh, extrapolate that and through other research efforts, there are an estimated 235,000 who experience homelessness in Canada a, a year. In, in the United States, about 1.6 million. Uh, most are sheltered in the two countries, but uh, that differs by city, which I'll show you on the next slide. Chronic homelessness is a major challenge for both of our countries. And then disparities themes are absolutely huge. So here in Canada, indigenous people are overrepresented in the homeless population. In the United States, where 
black Americans are about 13% of the population. Uh, they make up about 40% of the people who are experiencing homelessness. And then veterans I put here, and I'm gonna have some very important comments to make about veterans homelessness in the US, which I think are a sign of some kind of hope for us as we try to move forward and work on better solutions. So I wanna thank the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions and my wonderful colleague, Dr. Steve Huang, who could not be here tonight for lending me this slide because you can see in one quick look that rates in Canada and the US differ greatly and they, they also differ by percentages of sheltered and unsheltered. So if you look at Toronto or Boston, uh, my home city, most of the homeless are in sheltered situations. But in contrast, look at Los Angeles or uh, Seattle, for example, or San Francisco, where the unsheltered population is, is very, very high. And so when you have high percentages of unsheltered people experiencing homelessness, it really quickly becomes a public point of contention, and you are all very experienced uh, with, with that fact, I am sure. And so when we're facing this unacceptable humanitarian crisis, what should we do as a society? And easy solutions have defied policymakers for decades. Uh, we believe that from a scholarly point of view, we need to have robust integrated systems to identify risk factors, to explore the links between homelessness and health, to provide care for those experiencing homelessness who are some of the most marginalized pe people in our society with special attention to mental health, reconnect people to housing, support federal goals in the US and Canada, and then very importantly, appreciate signs of hope because this is a very difficult crisis but there's so many people in this space who inspire me personally and professionally, many of them in this room, uh, so many of them in my world back at Harvard. And then we in academia felt that we should call on universities and schools of public health like where I'm at to do more, to step up and to literally join every sector in redoubling efforts to address this issue together. Just a couple of weeks ago, I and a number of my colleagues wrote this article in the journal Public Health Report called Establishing Academic Homes for Homelessness, A Call to Action. And in the last several slides of my presentation, I'll be saying more about that. I did want to give a shout out to the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. They've put together this excellent resource, the Homeless Hub. You are probably all very familiar with it, but I must say, as one who had not been that familiar until relatively recently. It is really an outstanding resource, and I want to thank the leaders here in Canada that made that possible. So let's go through each of these factors very quickly in the time that I have. So people always ask, okay, why are we seeing this? What is the cause? And of course, it's a complex constellation of factors. We can start with the housing, which is the, the center uh, gray bubble there, and we can talk about the desperate need for affordable housing and the gap between supply and demand and affordable housing in countries like the Canada and US and elsewhere. This is a time of rising costs, rising inflation. So the, affordable, uh, the affordability issue, of course, is very important, but it's so much more complicated than that. So over on the right, people can experience uh, terrible personal circumstances, loss of a loved one through death, loss of a job, loss of finances, going through family breakup through divorce. They can experience, experience catastrophic diagnoses with respect to their physical health and very importantly, their mental health. The shadow of mental illness and substance use disorder is heavy in this whole area and needs a tremendous attention. Uh, people may be subjected to violence, whether it's domestic or otherwise. The role of poverty, of course, is undeniable. And then over all the way on to the left are social factors, economic shifts, COVID, the theme of discrimination and racism, unfortunately, is very prominent in this whole area for reasons you've already seen. And then we must summarize by saying that this is a, quite fundamentally a systems failure. 
and we have so many good people and very important organizations in multiple sectors trying their best. But in my view, unless it all is integrated and improved with tremendous urgency, we're going to see, continue to see this problem for a long, long time to come. And there are situations where people are trans, transitioning out of child welfare or hospitals or substance use treatment or the military or incarceration settings where they risk falling into the world of homelessness. And if we can protect people and have a strong safety net in those situations especially, that, that could help build a, a stronger social a safety net going forward. So, so those are some of the things we can talk about in terms of how to address this better together going forward. The links between health and homelessness hopefully are clear to you, but as a physician, I have thought about this for quite a while and have been taught by many other physicians who have been involved in this. Homelessness magnifies poor health. It increases exposure to communicable diseases like COVID and the flu. It complicates management of chronic illness, and it uncovers the deep fault lines in healthcare systems and society. In fact, I summarize this by saying that people experiencing homelessness are often literally living on the fault lines of society. And so when you're in that situation, your daily struggle for shelter and a warm meal overshadow your health needs and common illnesses and injuries uh, can fester. I must pause here and acknowledge my lifelong friend, Dr. Jim O'Connell, who is a national figure in this whole space. And Jim is the president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. And I, you see him here caring for a person on the street. Jim, several years ago, wrote this absolutely riveting book called Stories from the Shadows, where he describes caring for homeless for several decades. I had the great privilege of writing the foreword to that book. I would highly recommend, if you haven't read this, to please look at it. It's absolutely riveting. And if I can say it humanizes an area that needs human understanding because people who have fallen into homelessness are some of the most marginalized, stigmatized, and if I can say dehumanized uh, people in, in our society right now. So uh, when we talk about providing care for people experiencing homelessness, we also especially want to bring attention to the mental health challenges. Uh, one major international meta-analysis recently published documented that about 75% of people with chronic homelessness have mental health and substance use challenges. And so when you have that burden in a population like this, you have to treat patients where they are, including street outreach, employ trauma-informed care protocols, and that means assuming and not being surprised if the person before you has a lifetime of trauma and be ready for that and start to try to build trust, start with the most basic humane acts like offering blankets or socks or food, and then again, uh, providing robust care coordination. And if you want to read more about this, I would refer you to an excellent article published in JAMA Psychiatry two years ago uh, called Psychiatry on the Streets. There's a picture of the author, Dr. Catherine Coe, Dr. Katie Coe, and yes, she is my daughter. And yes, I am very proud of her. <laughs> so then the next part here is, of course, a reconnecting marginalized people to housing. And we try to do this through a system that involves uh, temporary housing, temporary shelter, the rapid rehousing, and then hopefully permanent supportive housing, and then housing on your own. I'm sure in the panel discussion, Keith can tell us more about this very important, very complex world. I must say I am particularly intrigued by the concept of by name lists for people who need these services, and maybe we can say more in the discussion, but the more you know exactly who you're serving by name, so it's not just a bunch of faceless statistics, and you can track people who have sometimes tremendous trauma and personalize the approach in terms of care and reconnecting people to housing, uh, the, the, hopefully the chances of getting people through this system uh, improve. And you see down on the bottom that uh, obviously you, your goal is to go from homeless on the left all the way over to affordable home ownership on the right. 
But that can be a very long, very, very difficult road. There are lots of efforts in Canada, in the US and elsewhere to offer support services and subsidies and also have improvements in rental housing for both landlord and tenant. Lots of challenges through COVID, uh, through all this. In the US, the Housing and Urban Development Department, HUD, employs what's called a continuum of care network to try to coordinate all this in uh, city by city and state by state. But this is very difficult work and it's very, very tough work and it's under-resourced if I can say. We have many millions of renter households paying more than 30% of their income for rent. And here's a factoid that I've been repeating to many reporters today, that in our country in 2020, in the US, for every 100 extremely low income households, only 36 units of affordable housing were available. So there's a tremendous demand, uh, a very suboptimal supply, and this is where people literally fall through the cracks. So another major theme that's already been mentioned in reconnecting people to housing is housing first and permanent supportive housing. This is a very important, very complicated area, so let me try to summarize it in one slide. And Canada should be very proud of their involvement in the at-home chez soi five-year randomized trial. Uh, this was critically important work for the world. Doing randomized trials uh, in this population is very, very difficult. In 2015, Housing First uh, was found to have a significant positive impact on housing stability for most. And then 2019, there was a follow-up here in Toronto. Dr. Huang and others, probably colleagues in the room, were involved in this, showing that this was particularly beneficial for those with high mental health needs. So the government of Canada and the government of the US ha has supported the Housing First approach, offering housing without preconditions. I am told here in Canada, a major challenge is adhering to the fidelity of this model that got these results. And then I should also stress that the outcome here that we summarized for 2015 particularly is housing stability. But we would all love to see if research could show that because of housing first, health outcomes improve as well. And then also ideally that health costs would go down but in 2018 in the US, there was a National Academy of Medicine report that did, found no published evidence to support that outcome. The committee believes that housing in general improves health and notes that permanent supportive housing is important. But the big issue here with the permanent supportive housing is the S, what the supportive services really mean. It can differ dramatically from person to person. It can be very time intensive. It can be very resource intensive. And then if this is shown to work, you need to track people for a long, long time. One study in Boston that was published by Dr. Jill Roncarati and her colleagues, Dr. O'Connell and others, was a 14-year follow-up of people who were put into permanent supportive housing. And the long-time retention rates were, were not sustained. So that's, that's a concern that we keep in mind as we try to have solutions if we can use that word, that are permanent, if we can use that word as well. A lot more research and work is, is needed in this area. So here in Canada and in the US, federal government has tried very hard to set up goals. In the US, there's a US Interagency Council on Homelessness that, that was established some 35 years ago, involves all the federal agencies. When I was Assistant Secretary in the Obama administration one year, uh, my, my secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, was the chair of the US Interagency Council. And then in 2010, a federal strategic plan was announced. And here's one very important outcome from that. There was a commitment to try to eliminate veterans' homelessness. And in the 12 years since, homelessness rates among veterans have dropped in half, although the uh, overall rates might be rising since 2016. So if you're looking for hope, and I'm gonna be saying this more in the next couple of slides, veterans homelessness, it could be something to look at and study more carefully, and I'll say more in a couple of slides exactly how that might have happened. 
in, in Canada here, we have a so-called reaching home strategy to support national housing. There's the logo for that. And then with COVID relief under President Biden, uh, an American Rescue Plan was announced that had billions of dollars for emergency rental assistance for housing choice vouchers and for housing services. Jeff Olivet, who heads the U.S. Interagency Council, has been, ha become a colleague for us in our initiative at Harvard, and uh, we thank him for his service. So uh, I did mention the signs of hope represented by veterans' homelessness. And so how do the VA and HUD, in, in collaboration under the auspices of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, help drop veterans' homelessness in roughly half? If you look at it, and I think we need more formal analysis, but from what I can tell, there was an effort to have the whole system work together to track patient housing status through the hospitals and through clinicians and doctor's offices and coordinate with shelter and housing parts of society, help veterans with rental and utility assistance, offer light case management. There are programs called HUD-VASH, HUD VA Supportive Housing, and the so-called SSVF program, uh, Social support, uh, Services for Veterans and Families. So we think, and we need to analyze further about how all these efforts coordinated, but it appears to have had an impact. In fact, there are 82 communities in some three states that have announced that they have effectively ended veterans' homelessness. And again, we need to analyze this further, but I think it is a sign of hope. And then, if I can say, through COVID, through this terrible last couple of years, I have been so inspired by homelessness providers who have stepped forward in a time of great need for very vulnerable people. If I can say on the bottom left is a picture of our Boston Convention Center, which was converted through the height of COVID into an emergency healthcare facility. Half the beds were reserved for the homeless population in Boston, and we, it was called the Boston Hope Center. And physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals from Boston helped staff this Boston Hope Center. And we actually wrote a case study on that for a study uh, at our school to just show that in a time of crisis, uh, we can do our best to protect vulnerable populations. And they led in terms of testing and vaccination and treatment. I mean, it's really been pretty extraordinary. And we've seen this type of effort going on in city after city uh, throughout North America and around the world. And I, I really tip my hat to the direct care providers who have done this type of work. Uh, in the center, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Roseanne Hegarty, from an organization called Common Solutions. And they have received a major grant from the MacArthur Foundation to try to reduce homelessness through intense coordination, through by name lists, um, and also focusing on data and uh, sharing lessons learned city by city. I, I think this organization is very, very impressive and offers us a lot of hope. And then we were struck when we saw this headline over on the right saying that there are cities in the United States like Houston that have moved some 25,000 people from the streets into homes of their own. If you look into this article and, and ask yourself, how did this happen? Again, the coordination in that city is very strong. And I must say there, the political leadership there has been very strong because multiple successive mayors in, in Houston said, we have to do something about this and we're gonna make sure that everybody responds to that priority. So political will is so critical. If I must say, going back to Boston Hope and that convention center, we saw that progress because the mayor of Boston at the time, uh, Marty Walsh, who was a tremendous supporter of underserved uh, people and is a person in recovery himself, uh, allowed that to happen and was enthused to have this happen for the homeless population in Boston. Mayor Walsh is now Secretary of Labor Walsh in the Biden administration and we're all very, very proud of him. So in the midst of all this, we want every sector to do more and now that I'm back as a professor, I must say I've been looking around at academia for decades saying who in academia is paying attention to this. We, we have some excellent investigators and professors in our country and I'm very in, indebted to and inspired by many of them. 
But I must say, if you look at our federal re research infrastructure, particularly NIH, our major research uh, agency, uh, health research agency in the US, the 27 institutes for heart, lung, and blood, for cancer, for diabetes and digestive diseases and kidney diseases, there's not a national institute for health and homelessness. And in fact, the funding in our country is usually by disease and not by a vulnerable population. And so when you don't have that funding from government on down, there are very few senior faculty with expertise. There are very few junior researchers who want to go into the field because they can't find mentors. There's a limited pipeline. And there are very few people who are qualified to even teach a course so the end result is that when young students come into schools like ours and other public health schools in the country, they don't get to hear about this from any of their teachers. They don't get to learn even the basics about the suffering that's happening right outside their organizations, right outside their walls. So three years ago at Harvard, we were very fortunate to establish an, a pilot initiative on health and homelessness because we want to build an academic home and bring people together and demonstrate that we thought that every student of public health should know at least the basics of why we are seeing this and why it's so visible. Uh, I want to thank uh, two private donors who made this possible. If they hadn't stepped up, I wouldn't be talking to you today. But we've made some progress, and we have uh, built a community. We have monthly newsletters. We have monthly seminars. We're bringing in great speakers. We've established our first course on health and homelessness. I want to thank Dr. Joe Roncarati and Dr. Maggie Sullivan, pictured here, who teach that. We're expanding educational offerings. We're facilitating research efforts. We're trying to send the message that academia can do more and every sector can do more, business and housing and education and faith-based groups and on and on. And then very importantly, we're trying to build partnerships around our country with the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, led by Dr. O'Connell, with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I want to thank my colleague Bobby Watts, who heads this amazing group that's 300 healthcare for the homeless groups in the US. I already mentioned the US Interagency uh, Council on Homelessness and the VA. We have some great collaborations with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Jack Sai in San Antonio, Texas, and we're hoping to do some more collaborative uh, research with him. So, now that we have started in on this pilot initiative, we want to train a new workforce. We want to create and try to help on the data systems, apply community-engaged research, address the stigma that often surrounds this issue, uh, explore the concepts of right to shelter and housing, do more on the housing first efforts that you are also familiar with, evaluate and address the affordable housing challenges, evaluate and improve healthcare and especially the behavioral health systems themes that I've already mentioned. And I'm hoping that if we can do this, we can have a more unified and more, more urgent response from all sectors of society. We, we believe it's time to educate students and motivate research and prepare for the next generation of health professionals. I must end with this quote from a Reverend, who is a mentor of mine, and he said that we should all care most for those whom society counted least and put last. And I think that's an appropriate way to end this presentation. Thank you very, very much. Everybody can hear me okay? Okay, so first, thank you to Dr. Coe um, for that incredible presentation to the Louis L. Odette Foundation and St. Michael's Hospital for putting on this event and for asking me back again to moderate. Um, it's always a great conversation to have. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. I mean, first, we're going to do basic introductions. 
just bear with me while I load up my three different devices. <laughs> Deeply organized. I'll say that um, on our panel today, we have uh, Dr. Karen Chin. She's the interim chief of psychiatry at St. Michael's Hospital. Harriet Kakinda, who is a client service worker and community health ambassador for the Toronto Shelter Network. And Keith Hambly, who's the CEO of Fred Victor. So I'm sure everybody in the crowd and following along probably knows quite a few of these people very well. In terms of housekeeping, if you're following online, you can submit questions and they will be sent to me on this iPad. Whether I get to them or not uh, in adequate time um, is unclear, and I apologize, but we'll follow up with you after. And I guess now what we wanted to do was I was going to start with a couple questions with Dr. Ko, just expanding a bit on some of the pieces he brought up during his presentation, and then we were going to have an open discussion. So one of the things that I really wanted to get into is you, know, you talked about the success of reducing veteran homelessness, and you also talked about trauma-informed protocols. And I think a lot of our discussion will center on the importance of mental health supports for people if they're going to actually stay in housing. And could you just tell us a little bit more about how that program works in terms of bricks and mortar, and then talk a little bit about its practical successes or the web of supports the, making the, it work? The veterans work? Or? Yeah, the veterans work. Okay. So to get, again, to stress, I think this starts with leadership from the top. And so when the Obama administration put this forward in 2010 as a national goal. I mean, their goal actually was to eliminate veterans' homelessness. They're halfway there, so I think that's really outstanding work. Um, they put funding and research and structures into the, into the VA system. And as I briefly mentioned, you know, if you go to a doctor's office in, in our country, so every once in a great while, the doctor or a nurse might ask you about your housing status, but most often they won't. But my understanding is that in the VA system, this is sort of a standard practice for a health visit there. And then that also helps you identify who not only is experiencing homelessness, but who might be at risk, and then might be a signal to the healthcare provider that those services might be strengthened at a key time until that, that threat passes. And then uh, case management is offered and Attention to uh, rent relief and uh, utility costs are all also offered. So there is this um, SSVF program, I'm sorry for the, uh, the acronyms that come, up, come out of the VA, the social, social supports for veterans and families, and then uh, an, an emphasis on connecting the worlds of clinical medicine and supportive housing through what's called the HUD-VASH program. There are many other parts to this, and. Um, Experts in the VA can tell you more about exactly how much money has been put in and the resources put in. But from where I sit on the outside looking at this, this is a population that's seen some pretty substantive improvement. And so if we can, extra first of all, study that harder, extrapolate from it, and then apply it to the 90% of the population that's not a veteran's population, maybe that's a way to go for the future. That was my short second question. I mean, when we're talking about political will, I mean, do you think in the United States, there's kind of a very pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality, and I don't want to separate the two countries because we have very similar problems, but do you think the model, there's the will to have the model expanded beyond veterans' care? That's a great question. And I think they started with veterans with the rationale that, that these are men and women who have served our country, and to have them do that and then return and then suffer from um, the challenges of homelessness was just not fair to them, which of course I think everybody would agree to. But why shouldn't that value also extend to everybody else? And you're absolutely right, Emily. There, there is this pull yourself up from the bootstraps philosophy, which is great. But on the other hand, there are people uh, or people who are going through times in their life where they suffer great loss and great misfortune, uh, bad luck, catastrophic medical diagnosis or challenges with substance use, which, it, which is uh, a, an illness that needs treatment. And that's the time when we need to support people. And it's, it's too uh, difficult to see when this gets complicated with the encampments and then the public disruption and then the subsequent stigmatization of the people who are literally 
get caught living on the fault lines of society. That, that's what really complicates all this. So, you know, if we go back to the basic value of you know, how we judge as a society, well, we're, we're ultimately judged about how we care for the most vulnerable. And as the Reverend said to me, which I repeated on the last slide, you know, we should care most uh, for those society counted least and put last. So I think when I see organizations like St. Michael's or the uh, commitment of the debt family, uh, I, I feel that and I think that gives me hope. And so I, again, I just wanna thank you for this opportunity for being here. Um, I think it's really exciting that there is political support for something, a program like that you can actually study and have data and meaningful results. And Dr. Shin, I wanted to ask you, just in terms of sort of the value of education, is there anything you wanted to identify at St. Michael's in terms of what is being done or could be done to sort of really help people better understand the connections between mental health and homelessness? For sure. Um, at St. Michael's, it really becomes part of the fabric in our identity of serving marginalized and vulnerable populations. And this momentum brings people together and actually creates excellence. And we can learn that this type of excellence can start to erode some of the stigma because it starts to bring people who are interested in research, making you know, world-leading um, uh, uh, studies, brings uh, healthcare professionals that want to learn and work in these programs. And it, it, uh, I, I'm in the Department of, of Psychiatry. We also, through um, philanthropic support from the Odette family, have created a new program uh, to serve uh, seniors who are homeless or precariously housed. And by providing clinical services, we also attract uh, new learners and uh, clinicians to train and become interested and become skilled and uh, at the end of the day become um, better physicians and can bring that expertise and we really end up training the new generation of healthcare providers. Um, and uh, it really it requires dedication on many different levels from um, the hospital, from philanthropy, from the university, um, and all of this together, along with connections with the, the city. And it, it, as you know, Dr. Ko said, the, the issues around um, homelessness um, are multifaceted. So when we bring a community together, all the different expertise that people have, if we can have a hub, um, this increases our chances and shines a light on the issue. Dr. Shin, I mean, St. Michael's Hospital is known for sort of leading the way in terms of research in these programs, but if we're speaking about the enormity of the issue, sort of where are we at in terms of actual education and, and practical on the ground teaching rolling out? So uh, this has to start right at the beginning and it has to change even in the curriculum. And this has been something that's happening over the most uh, recent years in the medical um, faculty of me medicine, um, I, I identifying leads and um, curriculum leads and educational leads in um, providing uh, services for underserviced uh, populations and also f um, ensuring there's equity, inclusivity in healthcare and also in, in the Department of Psychiatry. And I must say that um, uh, St. Michael's, uh, again, provides leadership in this, and I have colleagues in family medicine, and family medicine physician provides leadership in the um, family faculty of, uh, of medicine, and our psychiatry department has psychiatrists to provide leadership in our department of psychiatry that create um, rotations that, so the, the work in, in providing care for, for um, underserved populations isn't an aside, it's a rotation as valued as a rotation in internal medicine, in emergency medicine, that it becomes incorporated into the knowledge and the expectation that healthcare practitioners have this type of, type of facility in, in their skills when they graduate um, and become um, practitioners. Um, that gives me some level of optimism. Um, I would love to hear what Harriet has to say about this. And I think by way of starting this, maybe Harriet, you could tell us a little bit about how you came to do the work that you do and what kind of role from there. Thank you, Emily. Um, I came to Canada in 2019, June, 
and I was homeless for eight months. I was a teacher professionally back home. When I came to Canada, it was hard to get into the profession because of validating credentials with ways, and it was expensive for me. So I ended up getting to the shelter because I didn't have the money to pay for rent. I was there for eight months. I left when COVID kicked in. I got into this profession because when I started, um, when I looked at what I could study, I got a short course for eight months. It was a migrant women integration program. So it was teaching about social services. When I learned about working shelters and what I had learned from a migrant women integration program, I combined that two. Then I went into social services. I was so, and everybody knows we, we talk a little bit before we do these conversations. When you told me that you were a high school teacher, I was so interested in what you observed and sort of what you thought about ways that you could almost design a curriculum within the system that sort of helps people stabilize and move up and out. And is there something that you could describe as a step or something you think that's kind of missing when it comes to either healthcare professionals coming in or something provided at the shelter level? I would say when you get to the shelter, you get um, isolated, first of all, especially with the hotel program where people have to get their meals from hotel rooms. You just knock in the morning to give them breakfast, you give them lunch, you give them dinner. That is isolation. It brings about depression. It brings about mental health. And many people end up using substances. So I would think the health department should come in and tell people when somebody comes to you like a doctor, just look at that person the way he or she comes. If somebody is a substance user, don't judge him. Show them some love. Take them to the community. I understand the community gives to these people in the shelters, but they end up not getting to the community. I can get from the community, but I don't get to the community. What does it mean? If you give me like clothes, like food, but you've not brought me to the community, like I do volunteer work at times, at times you come and talk to us. You bring some programs to us, like in shelters, like you can come with games, you can come with music. Some people need education, and I understand most people in the shelters have had crimes behind their coming to the shelters, but these cases remain on their record for as long as they live. Yeah. It's not like a rest, like five years. If maybe after five years, they would say, your record is now good, you can end up working. People would change. They would go to housing, but again come back to shelters because that is the way they used to live. That is their community. When I think, I mean, when we talked, and you and I talked before about, you know, we have this problem with chronic homelessness in Canada. And I, I love talking to you about the idea of what you could actually do in the emergency system to sort of keep people up and lift them on track. And is there, do you think that should be a combination of, say, people coming in for medical care? Should there be a, a standardized set of rules to make sure people are connected to community a little bit better? Because that's a problem, or? People should be uh, connected to the community. How? Yeah. People should go and volunteer in the community. The community should also come in, like if there is a medical department which can come to the shelters, talk to them about different programs they can do or how they can lift themselves, it can reduce on their mental health. I have a Again, an optimistic image of you with a PowerPoint presentation in front of, <laughs> in front of leaders uh, in politics sometime very soon. Uh, so now I get to throw to Keith because none of this actually works without the people doing the work. And I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of your you know, overview of some of the challenges facing the sector who are trying to get this done. Sure, thank you. Um, oops, this one. 
it's on. Uh, yeah, I, I, first of all, I just want to applaud all the speakers here, and, and particularly uh, Dr. Shen around uh, the commitment for advanced learning in, uh, in the academic world here at St. Mike's for, for issues around homelessness. I think that's a, a positive step. Uh, the one thing, I, or one thing I want to highlight, and it's probably not lost on anybody in this room or online, is the challenges around not just recruitment but retention of staff. Uh, uh, I, I kind of half joked to a couple folks today that it's like we're coming out of two years of solitary confinement uh, of COVID and the impacts not, on not only on clients but also on our staff are delivering services in shelters and um, uh, drop-ins uh, and housing uh, uh, operations across the city of Toronto, if not Canada, uh, have been greatly impacted. Uh, when Dr. Ko talked about the uh, issues around homelessness, around trauma, uh, around impacts of poverty, those are issues faced by our staff as well. Uh, low income, low pay, I hate to say it, but also uh, issues of their own trauma, own personal trauma. When you mention something around, uh, see who you're talking to in terms of that person is a, a, a real person, it's the same for our staff too. Uh, and I think um, the challenges that we will be facing over the next couple of years is not just retention, but also how do we support the well-being of our staff coming into this sector? Uh, how do we prepare them better uh, to work with people who uh, have been chronically homeless for a number of years, who have uh, unsupported mental health um, uh, issues, uh, substance uh, use uh, activities that uh, can be at times fairly chaotic. And that has direct impact on how you manage or how you work and how you build trust with individuals in the sector itself. So I think it's preparing our staff who are coming uh, from, uh, from say George Brown or other institutions who are incredibly uh, um, passionate about the work of working with the homeless community, uh, but also give a sense of, okay, here's the reality of working in, in this sector. And I mean, with that reality, then there's the two factors when it comes to retention. There's, you know, money, so people mm -hmm. can actually live in the city where they're trying to help people Absolutely. not lose their homes. Yeah. And on top of that, um, there's the reality of, you know, compounded trauma from, you know, dealing with people who are having their own issues and losing your friends and how do we well, resolve that big question? Uh, uh, absolutely <laughs> and I, I think uh, in an expensive city like Toronto or Vancouver or other urban centres, uh, keeping pace with, uh, with inflation when it was only at one or two percent was challenging enough. Uh, inflation is now anywhere from five to eight percent. So the pressure will be on organizations that are at the front line of working with uh, uh, a homeless population or, or uh, a client facing organizations. Uh, we are under, people in this room will know, uh, Bill 124, which is a wage cap uh, legislation from the province that caps wages at 1%. There's going to be such pent up demand when that is gone. Uh, there's. There has to be commitment on the part of our funders across the board to pay the wages uh, or to, to support organizations to actually pay people properly. Uh, I'm going to say something else too. When, pardon me, like, when, I, when you say funders, just for, I mean, we're talking at the provincial level. Uh, well, Federal? provincial, primarily provincial level, but also municipal level. Where, um, organizations receive funding from all three orders of government, but primarily. Uh, the province, uh, which has imposed that legislation, I'm getting a little advocacy political here, but <laughs> uh, that, but also uh, at a municipal level as well. I, I think there's going to be some real challenges as we come out of collective agreements over the next couple of years and how we keep, uh, retain our staff, pay them well, recognize the, uh, the impacts of the work that they do, the important work that they do. Uh, in, in supporting uh, all clients across the board. The one thing I want to pick up what Harriet had talked about uh, around uh, activities within a shelter system or, or shelter, if you will, is actually relying on our greatest resource, which is not just staff, but people with lived experience that have come from the street, 
who have been homeless in the past, who have experienced uh, uh, mental health issues, experienced uh, substance use issues, they are the best people to actually build trust at the frontline level. And along with that, and this is a challenge for us at Fred Victor and for any organization out there, we must pay them the same wage. It's important work. Uh, their lived experience is just as valid as any other educational experience out there. I mean, I guess I would take that back to you. And just so everyone knows, at 6.10, we're going to open it up to the audience and the virtual questions. So we're just going to chat a little bit longer. But um, again, we always seem to come back to political will. And there always seems to be incredibly intelligent people laying out the numbers or the actual costs. You know, if you let a person fall into chronic homelessness, if you let them suffer from comorbidities, become traumatized, it costs us more. And I wanted to know, Dr. Ko, just based on the success of the Veterans Project, do you think that has shifted the political will or has created a greater understanding of that? Or is there a way we could get into that? Are people recognizing the value of it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that everyone in our two countries, particularly the political leaders, see that strategies up to now have just not been successful or acceptable. And as a public health professional, I see in this field the absolute necessity of interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation and planning. So I think some people have addressed this and some political leaders have addressed this purely as a housing issue, that's important. Others have addressed it as a poverty issue, that's important. Others have addressed it as a discrimination and racism issue, that's important. Still others have focused on the mental health and substance use parts, that's important. But we have to now put all those people around the same table and address this together. And so I, th I think this is a time to say the status quo is not acceptable. And the only way out is more unified, urgent, cooperation and, and planning together. And then we ask literally every sector to do more. So I'm speaking today on behalf of academia because I think we have just simply fallen short in educating our current students about what's happening right outside the walls of our own organizations. But hopefully every sector of society can step up and do more. By the way, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that private business can also do more. We have some examples in Silicon Valley, for example, where uh, some of those tech companies are trying to invest more in more affordable housing. We have in the medical world so-called um, uh, anchor institutions, anchor hospitals and medical centers, and then also from the educational world, uh, anchor educational systems, what we call anchor eds and anchor meds. Lots of times they're investing in their community in terms of uh, issues like this in affordable housing um, and then prevention of homelessness. So I think if we do that literally community by community, focusing on the by name lists as community solutions mentions and then really pushing that integrated approach that brings everybody together, ho hopefully that's, that's the way forward. And I think the VA experience from what I can tell, and this needs for further analysis, has started in on that, and that's why we're seeing at least some of the results that we've witnessed so far. Yeah, no, we've seen some great smaller examples um, out of Parkdale, and forgive me, I'm going to say the name wrong, but the, the Brooming House Trust, basically, again, you know, private equity coming in and helping preserve some of our most vulnerable stock. And I would love if large-scale investors came in and swooped in and, you know, grabbed a hold of rental housing buildings before they were taken over by REITs. Um, I have feelings on this subject. That's a long way of me <laughs> getting back to, uh, to Dr. Shin. Um, again, just to go back to the educational piece, can you talk a little bit practically? So we're talking now about preparing the next group of leaders to you know, make this all work. What are some of the things we need to focus on? Becoming a healthcare provider, working in, um, with, with this population, you really need to develop a sense of empathy and not just know your own experience, and you need to understand the experience of the, the patient that you'll be caring for. And if you're not, you're not um, uh, familiar with the environment, with the questions, with the skills to manage the you know, multitude of, 
I would talk about trauma, talk about the domestic. Um, often people who end up in um, situations of homelessness or in shelters have experienced domestic abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. If you're not aware of some of this knowledge and, and the, the, um, the epidemiology of this, and then you don't have the skills and the uh, familiarity and the comfort in working in these environments, then you're not going to, it's going to be something that's feared. And if that's the case, you're going to avoid. And as Keith was saying, you need to be able to be effective when you're a healthcare professional. So you need to be well skilled. And also, you want to drive the interest that this is you know, important, meaningful work, valued work, and work in which, let's come back to, it, it, it makes such an enormous difference to the community that we're living in. Because truly, we are all you know, interconnected in in this um, in the in the communities that we're living and working in. So, it's it, when we're thinking about training um, uh, new healthcare providers, um, having people like Harriet with lived experience, and we've been incorporating that definitely more in the education because it was always, I think, a little bit more of a top-down uh, authoritarian type of approach, an expert approach. And there is change in making sure that there is this collaboration and coming together at the table in a much more equal way. And I think that uh, builds trust in others. And if you're able to do that, you become a better um, healthcare provider. What does that look like in a practical sense as a clinician? Are you talking about sort of starting at the educational level or going out during residency? Or what would it look like ideally if you could? Wave a wand. I think it's both, right? It, it, it becomes part of the curriculum that there are social determinants of health, that it, the disease states are not just looking at the, um, the narrow biology, that you have to look at uh, more uh, societal, uh, financial um, uh, impacts and and then it is also the practical experience and learning from mentors and having the, 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 the people who are leaders to then inspire and mentor um, uh, the learners so that they do have the skills. And going into, uh, you know, at St. Mike's, I think we were just <coughs> chatting before about all the different uh, residency training positions that involve going into um, into the, the providing street health into the shelters and giving people that practical experience and uh, instead of it becoming something that's very stigmatized it actually is something that is very well sought after that people have a good experience in in doing this type of work and i think it, it can inspire them um, later on in their careers uh, Harriet, you're going to get the last one of this round and then we're going to move on to questions, but I guess I just wanted to ask you at a personal level, how does it feel having your actual experience and voice, um, you know, and be listened to in terms of these conversations or, you know, you're bringing this knowledge to the table. I mean, how does that feel as an individual? I guess it's a little gray, but I'm glad you're here to talk about it, so. I feel great. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I would say I came as a refugee three years back, but I'm able to share my experience with other people. And uh, like what I would say uh, to St. My Hospital, you should come down to the ground. Come to, like before COVID, I didn't see any medical group or people coming to shelters. But with COVID, I've seen each year, Intercity Health Association, at least it's coming down with uh, COVID uh, vaccines. It's coming out with um, shingles, uh, with uh, pneumonia vaccinations in shelters. But they just come to do their work. They don't talk to people. What I would think, you should come down talk to people, interact, share their experiences, you give them hope. Somehow instinctively I knew I would throw you a softball and then you would just kind of 
sharpen it out, <laughs> which is great. Um, I mean, Dr. Coe, maybe we'll end with you because we've got two more minutes. I mean, when you're talking about at the practitioner level, are you seeing, you know, doctors and psychiatrists in the U.S. Um, learning from people with lived experience at this point? Absolutely, and I'm just so delighted to get to know Harriet and hear her story. I mean, when you hear people with lived experience, it, it just humbles you, it inspires you, and it humanizes the whole conversation because it's so easy to slip into the uh, unfortunate uh, discussions that have really marginalized uh, people who are just on, on the edges of existence. And so I, I think making this um, literally an essential part of the curriculum, is, is, as uh, Dr. Shin has said, I think is absolutely key. Th this, shouldn't, should be, this shouldn't be optional in, in uh, health education. It should, it should be a standard part of what it means to take care of people. And uh, then, the, as we were talking about before, Emily, I think the whole philosophy of how we treat each other in society should be that you know, n no one should be going through this kind of trauma and suffering while the rest of us are, are stepping back and watching. I mean, everyone's got to step forward and, and do more and say this is unacceptable. So I'm, I'm hoping that our pilot initiative at, at Harvard can, can start. It, it, we're very proud of what we've done, but we've got a long, long way to go. And I must say that when we started, we reached out to the leaders in North America, and we reached out to Dr. Huang, and next thing you know, I got invited to speak here. So <laughs> it's, I think this is how the community gets built. This is how the network gets built. And then you, you teach each other, and it, and it goes back to the people with a lived experience who, who really know what it's like on the ground and can teach you and humble you and inspire you. So Harriet, thank you so much. And we all hope that we put enough pressure on government to give us the money we need to do this incredibly valuable work. Um, and I think the comment on what I guess we call othering is so important or why it is that we see some people as being more valuable than others is a, a rant I could go on for days. Um, so now we're moving over to the Q&A portion. So I've got some questions on the iPad or if anybody in the audience wants to hold their hand, someone will probably hand you a mic. And I've only got about 10 minutes to do that. So anyone want to ask something from the audience? Any of the panelists? Hello. Now is someone going to come with you to a microphone? Or you could come down here. Oh, do you have a written question? OK. My apologies, that was me messing it up. Um, okay, I think, I mean, I can go with some of the written questions. I think we're basically, you know, they're being fed into the uh, iPad and then I'm going from there. So there's a lot of general questions. Um, there's a lot of big picture questions like how can we fix this? And I don't think we can get into that with the time we have. Um, but, uh, let's see here. Sorry, bear with me for one second. I'm just weeding through a few questions. I mean, here's one that actually comes up quite a bit. And it's sort of a, it's just again relates to general humanity. So maybe I could put this to Dr. Ko because it's not, it's not an intellectual question, but it goes back to the idea of how we treat people. And a lot of people ask how we should interact with people who are marginalized or are homeless or what's an appropriate way to support people and Harriet them looking for you after this, but maybe we could get into that topic for a little bit because people always say, you know, should I give people change? You know, do I give money to X? You know, how can I support someone? What can I do to help? And it's so different and has so many layers. So that's a great question. And to start to address that and answer that, I think about the lessons that have been taught to me by the healthcare for the homeless professionals that uh, I've been honored to know, starting with Dr. O'Connell, Dr. Huang, and my daughter, if I can say, Dr. Dr. Ko. Uh, my daughter has taught me that in our society, it's absolutely acceptable to step over somebody who's lying on the street of a, of a sidewalk. I'm saying this as a, as a health professional, but uh, she has written and spoken and taught me that on a plane, if you're a doctor, the call is, is there, is there a doctor on the plane? You're expected to jump up and take care of an absolute stranger. We've, we've all seen that. 
But somehow, uh, the, the reverse situation is on the street, you know, there's somebody lying there and you just walk by. So I, I have heard Dr. O'Connell say when he's asked this question that if you can at least stop and make sure the person is okay, express concern, you know, whether you give them money or not is up to you, but at least look them in the eye and address them as a human being. That, that is something, because too often we just walk by, we just step over them. Uh, we, we don't even stop to see if they're, they're all right or not. Now, it, so that's the very individual answer. But, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if the standard response for anybody lying on the street is that people stop and ask, are you okay? Do you need help? I mean, that alone would be, I think, a step forward in, in humanizing this whole crisis. I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, Harriet, you know, we talked a little bit about COVID-19, and we haven't really gotten into that and in the isolation related to that. Can you just speak a little bit to what you saw in terms of how it impacted people who are already isolated? Like with COVID-19, isolation brought a lot of stigma. It traumatized people. People got mental health. People got depressed because like for COVID-19, you didn't have to get out of your room. You had to receive whatever you wanted to get from your room. You can imagine we have some old people who are in shelters. They stay in their rooms from morning to morning, and the following day is like that. So these people get depressed, they get mental health, and the substance use also increases. Um, I'm just, again, so I'm gonna be going through, um, and apologies, uh, we're not doing mics today, we're just doing the advanced questions on the iPad. Um, I wanted to ask Keith a question. So someone had you know, done this in the registration. Why is, um, if someone's not interested in being helped, I know that's kind of a big question, but sort of like, you know, if, if someone's not interested in receiving help, you know, how do you get them into a system, you know, meant to sort of move them up the chain? How do you work with people? I, I think you, you keep at it. Just because somebody says, I don't need help that moment, it doesn't mean you walk away. Uh, you keep uh, working with the individual, whether that person is in a shelter or coming to a drop-in, they've already made a first step, particularly if they come to a drop-in, to, to reach out for uh, some socialization, to reduce the isolation, as, as Harriet had said. Uh, I, I think a good worker just keeps asking the question, how are you? What can we do today? Those types of things. At some point, you've, you've built a bit of trust, you, you can move forward, uh, I'm struck by Dr. Coe's um, um, map, I guess, if you will, from homelessness to home ownership. Uh, it, it's a, a very good document. I've seen it many times, but that path is convoluted. It goes up and down, sideways, uh, in every which way but Sunday. Uh, so you, it's the patience and the ability to build trust on a long-term basis and being client-centered. So from an educational standpoint, it's just because somebody says no, doesn't mean that they don't want help at some point. I mean, that slides nicely into for Dr. Shin for something from our virtual chat. Again, sort of, if you're looking, say, training new healthcare providers specifically for homelessness assistance, can you give sort of an example of what's a technique or something that you might train to sort of get that conversation started? For sure. Uh, often, as healthcare providers, we ask questions that are loaded Sometimes we don't even realize we have our own assumptions into questions. So really being careful. Um, sometimes you talk about you know, well, who's in your home, who's in your house. And oftentimes I've seen um, trainees and you have to come back and say, well, you can't assume that someone is you know, in a home right now. You can't assume someone is in, in a house. You can't assume people's um, even um, the gender, sexual orientation, you have to find ways in which you ask these questions in a uh, open-ended, curious light. And uh, the other thing is you want to ask for permission, and this comes to the slide around uh, trauma-informed um, uh, interactions. You want to ensure people feel safe when they're asking you. You want to perhaps signpost around asking about things that 
um, might be sensitive. You want to give people permission to say, you know, that that's too much. I, I need to stop. And and then also asking people is like uh, what what, what Keith was saying, like always continuing to try and asking people what the help is that they want. Sometimes we have help that we want to give, but we don't stop and think, okay, is what we're offering what you need? And if it isn't, what are, what are the questions I need to ask? What do I need to learn from the person I'm helping in order to be uh, of use? So those are some just very practical things and just listen to yourself and, and, and also check in. You know, check in and ask the person, is what I'm offering, is this helpful? Um, and oftentimes we don't take that time to spend with people to really hear them out in a more complete way. But it sounds like you're building that into the curriculum. That's kind of the idea, isn't it? Like educating people at the beginning on how not to ask loaded questions or maybe giving people a bit of a blueprint. So, you know, even when there are not enough people to do the work and they're doing incredibly difficult work, at least they know what to say or there's a template. Yes, and also being in, in environments that are different than uh, the uh, clinic, the hospital, going into environments that healthcare can can be in much more untraditional environments. So I think it's taking people out of that box as well. So Dr. Ko, with the Harvard study, I mean, can you sort of give an example of maybe a few pieces of training or how you sort of sent people out, or how people are sent out to do that work effectively? Yeah, so I think um, having Harriet here and talking about the importance of working with people with lived experience is hugely important. Um, then partnering with people on the ground. So our strong collaboration with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program is absolutely essential. It gives us credibility, quite honestly, if I can say. We, Harvard lacks credibility. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not gonna even go there. <laughs> but I think the more you build partnerships with people in on the ground and then be supportive of them from, from the academic uh, point of view, that, that really helps build interest for, for the students. So, uh, and then we, you can do great outreach to other groups. Uh, Emily, you may want to know that uh, every year we have um, a Boston journalist leader, Larry Tai, bring people together for a, a week of learning about um, public health issues and how to cover them in the press. And for the last number of years, they're brought to Boston Healthcare for the Homeless where about six or seven of us speak about homelessness and then everybody goes out on a van, out onto the street for, for several hours at night. So that, again, has brought attention to these issues and has humanized it. And so I think the more we can do something like that for our students as our initiative goes forward, I think I'd be very excited about that. Uh, that does sound incredibly interesting. So there's one more kind of big question. I guess maybe Dr. Ko will end with you as well. So it's basically is, you know, is healthcare um, the solution to this problem? Is health policy the solution to this problem? This money, this fractured, bogged down. Yeah, so I, I think a public health approach is, is a potential way to look at it. And public health increasingly, and we've all heard the term tonight, understands that, um, as I like to say, health is much more than what happens to you in a doctor's office. This is about social determinants. <clears throat> in fact, I often say that health is much more than what happens to you in a doctor's office. Health starts where people live, labor, learn, play, and pray. And I made that up, so I'll say that again. <laughs> health starts where people live, labor, learn, play, and pray. And what's been fascinating for me in my career as a physician and public health professional is to see how over time more and more people become public health partners and colleagues that you never dreamed would be working with you. People who have nothing to do with a health education or a medical education or ever been to a, in, worked in a hospital setting, but they're in media or they're in law. law as a, we haven't talked much about rights, uh, but Lawyers are very, very important. People from the political world, people from the business world, people from the faith-based world, 
they're all part of a, a public health network, especially for a challenge like this. Because I don't think we're going to be able to solve this unless all those groups are working together in an interdisciplinary public health approach. Yeah, one hopes that we get all hands on deck at some point. Abso um, absolutely. Because <laughs> there's so many excellent people who have solutions. They're just, again, it's about funding and political will, but we won't go down that road. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody's questions. I tried to crunch them as best I could, but now we're turning it over to Lou Odette uh, to make some remarks. And I think we thank all of our panelists at this point. I'm going to give you the floor. Um, I'm Lou Odette, and I'm a director of the PL Odette Foundation, along with my sister Francine, my brother Mark, and my brother Paul, who's here tonight. And um, so we initiated this annual lecture uh, together with St. Michael's Hospital uh, in order to bring together. Uh, experts in the field uh, and uh, practitioners in the field of uh, uh, challenges related to homelessness so that we could have a public discussion every year. Not only a discussion uh, in public, but a discussion with the public. So I'd like to thank everybody who uh, journeyed here tonight to be with us and everybody who's joined us online and uh, who have um, uh, uh, submitted uh, interesting questions, good questions tonight, uh, because that's very important. That's a very important part of what we wanted to do is to make sure that everybody contributed here. But um, of course, I'd like to also thank our uh, our panelists uh, tonight, uh, Harriet, Keith, and Karen, for bringing your perspectives, your um, your experience, and your insights to this problem. Uh, I'd like to thank Emily for being our moderator. I know it's a, a lot of work to prepare, um, and you've done this now for a couple of years, so we appreciate that uh, tremendously. So thank you very much for that. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Koh for traveling here from Boston. Uh, he's uh, a, um, one of the top experts in the field, and he's given us a tremendous uh, presentation tonight and contributed uh, uh, tremendously to the discussion. I know also behind the scenes he's talked uh, to um, to the newspapers, to the print, to uh, the TV, to radio, podcasts. He spent a tremendous amount of time uh, over and above what he's given us tonight to, uh, to help uh, raise the discussion on homelessness in this city. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Go. And with that, I'll end the, end the, the talk. Thank you.